Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's 5 by 15. Thank you for being with us. Tonight, we're really excited to bring you a very special conversation about time, that thing that none of us seem to have quite enough of. Uh, and it's also a conversation about the universe and about our place within it. These are big topics, of course, big questions, and we really can't think of anyone better to share their insights on them than tonight's speakers. Two incredible thinkers from whom we can learn so much about knowledge itself and time management in our own lives. So tonight we have with us Carlo Rovelli and Oliver Berkman. Carlo is a leading theoretical physicist and is often referred to as the poet of physics. His books, which include seven brief lessons on physics and the order of time, are international bestsellers and have been translated into 43 languages. His latest book, Helgoland, about the founding of quantum physics, tells the story of a German, of German physicist Werner Heisenberg, who in 1925, at the age of 23, took himself off to an island in the North Sea and wrestled with an idea that would change our conception of the world forever. Helgoland was an instant bestseller and was chosen as a book of the year by The Times, The FT, The Guardian and Prospect. Carlo is no stranger to 5 by 15 and has done some fantastic talks for us before. Carlo is going to be in conversation tonight about the book with another best-selling author, the writer and journalist Oliver Berkman. Oliver is author of The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking, and more recently, 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals, a book about how we choose to spend our limited time on this earth. For many years, Oliver wrote a popular psychology column for The Guardian, and he has a devoted following online for his writing about productivity, mortality, and how to live a meaningful life. As is the usual format, Carlo and Oliver will be in conversation for around 45 minutes, and then we'll be taking questions from you, the audience. So if you have a question for Carlo or for Oliver, please do post it in the Q&A box at any point during the event, and Oliver will, will pick them out uh, in the Q&A section. We are so thrilled to have both of them with us this evening. Oliver, over to you. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jack. Um, well, I'm so happy to be here this evening, uh, have this opportunity to speak with you, Carlo. Let's start by acknowledging that this is an interesting moment, maybe, at least in British public life, to be speaking about uh, time. I don't think you have to be a staunch monarchist or anything like that to feel that uh, these questions of duration and uh, longevity are all on our minds a bit here in the mo at the moment. Maybe there are people joining us from the nine hour long queue to um, see the, uh, the Queen's casket in, in London. Um, you know, we have this, this situation where um, a, a, a person whose presence has been a sort of a constant um, through not only my life, but the life, almost the whole life of my parents is suddenly not with us. And a sort of reminder that actually there's, a, I feel like there's a sense of uh, the impermanence of everything is somehow, is somehow driven home by, uh, by this, uh, at uh, this moment. Um, anyway, so maybe this is a setting for the, for the discussion we're going to have tonight. When I wrote my book about time, it was clear to me that I was going to have to completely bracket any attempt to engage with the physics of time. Otherwise I was going to go completely insane. I was, I, I wanted to write a book about what we, how we relate to and think about our finite time, uh, how we make meaning from that time and how we can deal with all the challenges to it, distraction, overwhelm, the feeling of always living in the future. And when I came to read uh, your book, Carlo, the, not the one that was on the slide, your newest book, Helgoland, but this one, The Order of Time, which is another fantastic, fantastic book and everyone should buy it. Um, it totally blew my head off, but I also made me realize that I'd made the right decision uh, as a writer in in try in just sort of leaving this topic well alone because um, uh, partly because it's so sort of um, mind blowing, but also because what you do in that this book is is essentially piece by piece for the first part of it anyway undermine uh, remove all the things that I thought I knew about what time is the idea that um, you know. Uh, it flows from the past through the present into the future. The idea that there is a sort of um, uh, a single objective concept of time against which we can measure our lives. Even the idea that there is one present moment everywhere 
in the universe. So I really want to get to what this understanding of time does for our quest to make meaning out of time. But maybe first it would make sense if you could, if it's not uh, too absurd a question, sort of, uh, if I could, if you could take us through some of this sort of defamiliarization, uh, give it a little bit of the sense of reading your book or the first half of your book, let's say, which is to suddenly realize that maybe absolutely nothing in my life is, is, is as I thought it was. Um, Oliver, thanks a lot. First, uh, first, thanks a lot for 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 accepting this conversation. It's uh, it's very thrilling for me, and uh, uh, I I'm very happy that we can do that. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, in a sense, my my path has been the opposite of yours, uh, but uh, uh, going to the same uh, toward the same convergence, uh, because I, I I my interest in time started uh, uh, the, the the other extreme with respect to yours, right? So not from the at least my professional interest in time, not from the our attitude toward the uh, temporality around us, toward the mortality, toward the brevity, the four thousand weeks that we have. Uh, it's hard now not to think of a, after <laughs> after your book is it's hard not to think of our life in the, uh, in in these terms. Um, it started the opposite direction, namely uh, the the time is a is a key ingredient in all physical theories. Uh, it's measured by clock. It's a very well-defined, clear-cut, uh, scientific in this in the in the dry sense of the word scientific uh, notion. Uh, that is the foundation of, say, Newtonian physics and and and, and so much of the rest of physics. Um, and uh, in uh, trying to write about that, and uh, in trying to write uh, about what has been discovered uh, about time, the physical time, um, I have uh, uh, constantly moved more and more toward uh, engaging with the same sort of question that you engage with. And the reason is uh, because, uh, uh, as you're saying, what has happened in the in, in physics in the last uh, hundred years, a little more, it's a, a remarkable set of discoveries that regard time, which have upset uh, yeah. in a very dramatic way the 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 the, the way we, we used to think time and the way the time was codified in, in Newtonian physics. And I have uh, already one uh, one super simple uh, example of that, which is at the opening of my book, The Order of Time, which is the fact that uh, physical time, clock time, the, the actual time measured by clock, the, the, the time that determines the, the, the pace at which processes go, I don't know, a pendulum moves or something falls or whatever happens or a flower blows. So we think the, 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 the speed of time is not the same for everybody, which means that clocks go at different speed, depending on something, and in particular, depending how they move and depending where they are. So if if I if you just raise two clock one respect to the other one, wait a little bit and, and bring back together, literally the uh, clock uh, higher uh, measure uh, more time than the clock lower. So this means that there is more time up here than down here, and this is a small discrepancy at our scale. It needs very good clocks for uh, detect it, but it's real. We have good clocks and we can detect it. Um, and it becomes very strong uh, uh, in certain conditions. For instance, near some very heavy object, a very heavy star or planet or even a black hole becomes huge, this, uh, this effect, which already means that uh, the idea that there is a single time sort of ticking out uh, at some fixed rate, the life of the universe is completely wrong. Time is more complicated. And there is a number of things like that that have been discovered by, uh, by physics, which uh, have taught us that the uh, a common notion of time is really an approximation, okay? The idea that we'll have uh, age at the same rate is an approximation because none of us goes near a black hole and none of us move sufficiently fast. So, except the movies, movies that correctly depict a situation in which a guy could live with a little daughter and come back when his daughter is much older than him. Because for him, less time has passed, the more time has passed for, for the daughter. So um, the, the time of our uh, the usual notion of time, everyday notion of time is an approximation. 
which means that there's a better note of time, it's better note of time. There are many no notion of times. And uh, if you want to understand time, is is, is a set of layers. And in, in my book, I talk about these layers, uh, which make up our usual notion of time um, because of some approximation, because of some imprecise picture and things like that. But more importantly, um, some of the aspect that seems so natural about time, which we have to discard if you want to do physics, are not in the clock, are in our mind. Okay. When we when we say time in our mind, we don't just mean the, what the clock indicates. We mean that we remember the past and the anticipation of the future. And how much past we remember, it's just depend on our brain, not on any structure of time. Mm -hmm. How much we can look into the future, how much we anticipate the future is depending on our brain. So our feeling of temporality is the depend of our mental structure, how, depend on how the brain works, not on the physics of time. So what I do in my book is try to separate all these things and realize that uh, when we talk about time, uh, we're talking about Newton equations, about Einstein equations, about our brain, about thermodynamics, uh, and about the spiritual attitude that each of us have about time. And we cannot disentangle the notion of time unless we, we, we look all the species together. It's so fascinating and kind of deeply unnerving at the same time. <clears throat> um, just before we move on to some of the implications of this worldview, I would love to ask you one more question about it, because um, it may be that people are a little bit familiar with that one example you gave of, of clocks at different uh, different places measuring different times. I'm not saying that they or, or I really know what that can can mean on a deep level, but it's a but it's a relatively familiar example. You go into some other examples and other um, uh, properties or apparent properties of time in this book that that uh, I found even more unsettling. Um, one of those is um, the the notion that uh, time, uh, it, the, the past, the present, and the future are in some sense distinct uh, things. Is that the right word? Um, and and also relatedly um, that. Um, to, to, to speak of it, there being a single now uh, is also problematic. I wondered if you could go into that a little bit more. Um, yes, we have a very intuitive notion of now. For me, it's clear what my now is. If I say now, I indicate a particular moment of time here. Um, but when we talk about now, we instinctively think that the now is not a property here where I am, but there's a now all over. I mean, you and I, Oliver, are in the same now because we're looking at one another and now, now we, are, we, are, we are both doing this. And then now something is happening in New York and something is, is happening on Mars and something is happening in a, in a galaxy or Andromeda, there is a now. Um, well, that's factually wrong. <laughs> uh, there is no well-defined notion of now elsewhere be, beside here. And even between me and you, <laughs> Uh, I look at you and uh, uh, I don't see you now in, in any intuitive sense of now because uh, uh, I always see you a little bit in the past. We are connected by, by uh, electromagnetic waves. It takes time to travel. But even if you, we were in the same room at a meter of distance from one another, nevertheless, light would have to fly from you to me. And that's take a small time, but time. So I would always see you in my past and you will always see me in, in, in your past. So we're never in the same now. We send message to one another, uh, but they this message gets to one another at, at the now, which is not the same now, the moment is, is uh, departed. And if uh, what has come out of the physics of the last century, that if you try to order this messaging and, and think that there is a common now all over, you get things wrong. Uh, it's really factually so. Uh, there's no way to, the, the question, what we mean by now come from the approximation if we disregard the travel time of signals. The question of what is happening right now in a distant galaxy is really a meaningless question. There's no meaning. I can send a light ray to a galaxy and when we will arrive, something will happen there. Or maybe I will receive a message from a galaxy and then that's, it will happen at some point there. But 
between the moment in which a signal was sent to me and a moment in which I would uh, uh, send a signal was received there, in between there is no special point which is a now. So there is no now in the universe. The now is an approximation. It's only here and now. For me and the uh, and for you, which is a relative concept, concept is relatively to me, me here now. There is a, uh, there is a now, and this disappearance of now is it's a profound because a question of a sense of reality, right? Yeah. We used to think the reality is what is real now, but there is no now in physics if we are precise. So but we can still use the word real, but we have to be careful not to get entangled with using in a way that doesn't correspond to how actually things work. Does this mean that the sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead, please. Does this, I was going to say, does this mean then what it seems to suggest, which is that the past and the future are as real? Uh, as yes, uh, yes, that's uh, that's it comes a little bit with that, and it uh, even stronger another chapter of physics, uh, uh, which has uh, shown that uh, we see an immense difference between the past and the future. Right, we remember the past. We don't yeah. remember the future. We can choose the future. We cannot choose the past. Uh, we see, you know, things falling and then standing, uh, stopping down, but we don't see things going up themselves. So um, the world is time oriented, but the fundamental grammar of the world is not time oriented. The world is sort of time oriented, uh, uh, not because the past is intrinsically different from the future, because things are arranged in a way. Um, you know, it's like somebody living in the uh, in, in the mountains. If you're in Italy, uh, the mountains are north, so you may think that north is naturally where things go up. But if you're in Germany, the mountains are south, mm. uh, the other side of the Alps. So you may think that south is where naturally things go up. But of course, up the mountain doesn't is not related to north or south. It's uh, it's uh, just accidental of how things are. Uh, how the Alps are settled uh, in that particular part of geography. So uh, the past and the future is something similar. We live in a space-time region, which is such that it's like if in the past there were some mountains that slowing down toward, toward the future, uh, we could live in, in a situation in which there was no, no mountains or up and down or other 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 geography there's nothing in the grammar of the world that is this distinguish the past from the future and that's strongly counterintuitive because we have such a dramatic sense that you know time cannot but flow in that one direction mm -hmm. uh but that's just uh, because our brain think in this way we we are oriented things we are in this uh, sliding it's uh, the physicists call it the second law of the thermodynamics the growth of entropy that's the name they give to this uh, um, to this ha accidental happening that give us the sense of uh, distinction between the past and the future so um with apologies to anyone in the audience who would just like to stay on the purely on the physics i i want to Ask yeah, why this, move a, move this, away this from that. Us, because it seems to me it does leave us <laughs> in a fairly terrifying place. I mean, you refer in this book, The Order of Time, uh, to the to the um, to to what we're left with uh, when we sort of demolish time in this way. As um, I'm quoting here, an empty, windswept landscape, almost devoid of any trace of temporality. It's a very evocative phrase. It's actually quite reminiscent of description of Helgoland in your new book. Uh, I have the sense that you, like me actually, are sort of drawn to this sense of windswept-ness. There's something kind of appealing about it. But you could well imagine in the temporal context, people finding it um, uh, quite terrifying and sort of um, seeming to give on to a kind of uh, nihilism. You you talk about how or you've just been talking now about how our human psychological experience of time uh, is not the same as the the sort of the, the underlying reality, but it it's tempting to go further and say that it's almost as if we are living a lie, right? I mean, if you think about any of the um, the most basic sense in which we try to give our lives meaning. Uh, no matter how we, an individual person thinks they should go about doing that, but it's on some level to do with taking this time that I have, uh, seeking to do something valuable with it instead of 
worthless, maybe um, getting wiser, I hope, through my through my, the course of my life, becoming ending up um, in some sense better than when I started. A million different uh, things that people take to be a foundational to meaning in life, um, which it would seem to me, uh, you know, setting a goal and achieving it in the future or uh, hoping to achieve it in the future. I mean, it would seem that uh, one somebody might read, say they read the first two thirds of your book and then and then stopped because you do turn to some of this uh, later on. Um, that there's kind of there's no point in doing anything. It's a sort of existentially terrifying vision. Um, I put it to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a very uh, deep question because it's a question. I, it seems to me that uh, our civilization, a Western civilization, in the last century, has put itself. Um, and uh, I would answer that uh, Oliver of all the people you probably are the one who uh, could know the answer <laughs> because you write about um, the fact that we can give meaning to time and we can uh, 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 change the way we perceive our existential relation with time um, and I think we certainly can uh, both by uh, our culture, our thinking, uh, and for what for what we are, uh, I think the the core answer to the question you're raising is that uh, we made a mistake, and it was really a mistake. I think some of us or the, our civilization mm -hmm. made a mistake in the past by requiring that meaning should come from outside ourselves. And by only granting meaning that would uh, uh, come from uh, uh, from somewhere else, and uh, this made us blind, it seems to me, to the fact that every time we talk about the things you were you're raising, so uh, uh, meaning, setting a goal, having a goal, uh, we're talking about what we are, what we do naturally because uh, of our uh, culture, biology, chemistry, physics, uh, the, the, the entirety of, of, of what we are. We are not things which are given a goal from outside. We are things which are full of goals ourselves, <laughs> even sometimes too much. And we have better you know, manage and, and, and calm us ourselves down. In, in all possible ways, if I um, am thirsty, there is no philosopher who comes and tell me, look, uh, do you really believe your desire of water is well-founded? Uh, you know, I punch him in the nose and I go <laughs> get water, okay? Yeah. If I am hungry even more, if I want justice even more, if I'm in love even more, if I want knowledge even more, if I believe in a better world even more. So everything we do, it's, uh, we are meaning. Because that's what we are. We are a machine that produ produces meaning. Um, and we do that in a way that drives us ahead, sometimes create trouble to, to ourselves. So we better self-reflect refle refle about these things. Sometimes even, you know, we're thirsty, but we stay willing, which I don't drink because I I want to give a glass of water to a child who is more thirsty than me. I don't know. Um, so. We, we 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 juggle with different with a lot of different uh, uh, drives that come from from ourselves. Uh, but if we make the mistake of saying, "Oh my God, uh, there is no foundation of all that," we are looking for something which is ne not needed. I think. Yeah, that is fascinating. It makes me think. I mean, it makes me realize that. Um... You know, I think one of the things I try to cover in, in my book is the sense that a lot of our troubles with time actually come from treating it as something that we, in a way that we think we ought to be able to treat it, but actually we can't. Um, it's almost as if we have a, some kind of intuitive understanding that it isn't the thing that the culture has told us that it is, that we're almost in touch with some of these um some of these truths of physics on a kind of 
unverbalized way. I'll just say briefly, what, give an example that springs to my mind. Um, talking about the, the, the feeling of worry, which is a sort of in, inherently temporal thing, right? It's the, it's the attempt, it, uh, or I suggest in my book anyway, that it's an attempt to um, f achieve a feeling of certainty about the future um, that is given its feeling of suffering from the fact that on some level we understand that the future is not something that we can achieve that kind of of control over so we are we we go about life as if we have time as if time is at our disposal and yet on some level we understand that we only ever get one moment after one moment after one moment you know we understand in our bones as it were that uh that our efforts to try to treat time as this objective resource, this place where we can go to find meaning is not quite really the, 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 the truth of the matter. And that takes a lot of people, including me into very, and I think you into various spiritual traditions that sort of ask that question in that way. But it's, it's almost like we, it's almost like we sort of realize that the thing we're trying to do with time uh, is not is is not going to work. Is not a viable. Yeah. Um, look, uh, I I was immediately uh, driven to your book by the subtitle uh, <laughs> "Time Management for Mortals," uh, which is a cou cou courageous and uh, and very beautiful subtitle. Uh, mortal. Uh, I mean, I'm very attached to this uh, uh, noun adjective. I don't know noun. I suppose here. Uh, this is the way the Greek civilization uh, used to call humans, right? The Greeks were calling themselves mortals, so very, very common in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the way, which is a way of designate ourselves, uh, stressing the fact that we're going to die. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's very central in, 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 in your book. And the, uh, the four thousand weeks is a, it's a, um, it's, it's pointing to the, to what in is implied by the brevity of life and, and uh, which is due to the fact that we're gonna die and we're gonna die for sure. Um, I think that in all that, uh, there is a lot which is uh, uh, very powerful inside us and at the same time, far from obvious <laughs> and, uh, and uh, possibly confused. I go in, uh, in one of my book, I, I, uh, throw there a, a, a bold attempt uh, um, uh, to say uh, why I think we uh, fear death. Uh, and I call it a mistake, uh, an accident uh, mm -hmm. of, of uh, evolution, uh, because uh, there's a perspective for, for which th there's no reason whatever for fear feeling, fearing death, which is a given. So why should we fear something which is uh, unavoidable? Um, and the, the, the point that I make is that uh, all animals, uh, uh, all mammals like us, uh, uh, have uh, very strong uh, um, emotional reactions uh, when there is, I don't know, a predator trying to jump on them, they get scared to death, <laughs> they get super scared, they run away and so on, or fight, or whatever. Um, and this is uh, obviously a very um, uh, reasonable thing to have in evolutive terms for a, a, an animal because it, it allows the, the animal to live more, reproduce and so on and so forth. But this is not fear of death because in, in the future, this is a, a very brief uh, explosion of emotions Mm -hmm. That is connected to the fact that one needs to run very fast to gather all its, uh, its, you know, it's, uh, it's just a, you know, all the adrenaline that boom, uh, because, uh, you know, go away, there is a lion. Yeah. However, in the evolution of these monkeys that we were, big, big apes that we were, one of the things that happened for sure is that uh, uh, we developed this brain that does a lot of peculiar things that most other um, uh, uh, mammals do not do. And uh, perhaps the thing, and this is really a book, the, that we do most peculiarly that is to um, all animal remember a little bit of the past, anticipate a little bit of the future, right? My cat, if I do something, he remembers it half an hour later, obviously. And uh, 
he, he knows and anticipates where the food is going to be and goes there. So he lives in time, but the span of time of his uh, memory and uh, uh, aims uh, is short compared to mine, mm -hmm. incredibly short. Mine, I know about, uh, you know, the history of the Roman Empire and the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And I think about the distant future. Humankind started to uh, uh, grow vegetables, uh, uh, do things on the long term, and develop this thing of cu the culture for having more and more memory and more anticipation of the future. And in this process, uh, it became to us humans very clear that at some point there is our final death. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, uh, this triggered uh, the, the fear of the lion, uh, which was not meant to, to do that. So it's a, it's a combination of two evolutionary push, push that has nothing to do with, what, with, with another. So there's no real reason of, of fearing death. And let me add one point. Um, 4,000 weeks is very short. And in my book, uh, The Order of Time, I talk about the brevity of lime over and over and over again. And I have a lot of quotes by uh, the Roman, uh, the Latin poet or Horace, mm -hmm. uh, who's all about the brevity of lime. But one day I was talking about my book in, uh, in, in New York, in a, in a gathering in a, a Columbia University, some professors, many several old professors. And uh, it was a very interesting conversation. And one, um, uh, retired professor in his uh, 90s told me, you know, Carlo, uh, the book is very nice, but there's something I disagree with. I said, oh, what? What is this? He said, Carlo, you keep saying that life is short. It's not true. Life is long, 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 extremely long. <laughs> I'm 90. You have no idea how much things have happened in that about two years. And if you think of the Queen, you can say, well, that's maybe the case. So um, we live so long. Mm. Well, it's all relative, isn't it? This is the uh, this is the long or short as compared to what? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have a I have a direction I want to go with that. I'll just stop briefly and say that in ten minutes or so, I'll um, I'll move to questions. So do keep do um, do send those questions in. I can see some coming already, and it'd be great to great to have more. Um, so one of the things that I kept running into when I was researching my book was this sense that there is a way, a different way of experiencing time. Um, I sort of go on at length and somewhat speculatively about how I think a medieval peasant would have uh, would have experienced time um, and drawn some work from anthropology about communities that live in in what they call uh, a task orientation mindset rather than a time orientation mindset. And when you talk about uh, us having made a mistake at some point in the development of our civilization in terms of seeking meaning out outside of ourselves, and then I maybe a, a, a development of that is then, you know, with industrialization and, and, and clock time and all the rest of it to seek maximizing the value of time as being a big part of that external quest for value. I'm, I'm just interested, it seems to me like maybe that other way of being in time, I call it in the book deep time, but it has a million different, it gets referred to in a million different ways. I, I, I think it's, I think it's what Heidegger is talking about when he talks about the idea of being time, the, uh, this notion that maybe we are time in some meaningful sense. And it's an experience that almost anybody watching this will have had in moments, right? The notion of time dropping away, the notion, because as you say in your book, you know, we certainly don't get the notion of an objective uniform time from our own experience. Time goes horribly slow and horribly fast and depending on the circumstance, I, I, this is all a very disjointed way of asking whether that way of being in time, that sort of sense of timelessness that we all know at least a little bit is in some sense truer or a more real understanding of who we are in time. Um, yes. Uh, oh, this is a good, this is a very good question. Um, I, I think what is truer, and uh, I think your book is very wise on that, uh, is to realize that uh, 
um, there are different manners of putting, placing a self and time or living as ourself, living in time, uh, living in the sense of existing, being in, uh, in, in, in this flow of time. And when you make this distinction, um, which is uh, very beautiful for me as time as a, as a, um, uh, as a resources, uh, uh, we, we, we conceptualize that we have, we have to do this and this and this and this, uh, and we have a certain number of hours. Uh, so time is the resources and how can we, uh, you know, these hours are not sufficient for doing that. Oh my God, so what? Uh, we are thinking about time as a thing out there to be used to get there. We're taking our, our, ourselves outside temporality, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, placing the objects uh, outside temporality, us outside temporality. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I would not say in a high, a la Heidegger that this is inauthentic and there's a authentic i would say this is stupid and there is a better <laughs> an alternative which is much better if we can practice it and if we can um which certainly is in the direction you you beautiful explain it you beautiful describe in uh, in your book which is to realize that we're not in time out time we are time we are the process in fact in physics no doubt uh that's a the I would say the core of modern physics of, of temporality, there isn't time. Time is not a thing which is out there or something that passes by itself. Time is just the name we give to the happening of things. And if time is in particularly, and I think that's um, Heidegger uh, insight, uh, time is in particular the name we give to the happening of ourselves. So in yeah. that sense, we, we are time, right? So we're not in time. We don't have a more or less time. We just start, we are that things. So we, uh, it's silly to treat time as a resource. Sometimes, you know, we have to do that because we live in a, in a, in a life in which we have to manage time and look at the clock and so on and so forth. So, but certainly um, the direction you indicate uh, sounds to me, if not more authentic in some major philosophical term, which I am a bit skeptical about, uh, certainly, uh, nevertheless, uh, um, something which it's much closer to the, uh, to, 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 to the physical understanding of time, it seems much wiser mm. as a way of being in this world. Whether the middle age peasant uh, were able to do that is possible, I don't know. Uh, there are peasants right now in the world, uh, which live, uh, I mean, the world is not, uh, don't, most of the world don't live like me here in Verona or in Canada or you in London, we live in a very different manner. Um, and uh, a lot, big part of the world is working, you know, waking up with the sunrise and uh, working the land. And uh, and uh, I don't know how they uh, uh, leave time. But I have had a beautiful day in my life, which maybe it was all my fantasy, but I was in uh, in Africa in uh, with a group of hunter-gatherers and mm -hmm. I spent uh, a full day with them and uh, uh, hunting and, and uh, Staying around the fire and uh, laughing and uh, just and I was the thing what really surprised me is that uh, how re incredibly relaxed yeah. and serene they were with uh, with life. There was no sense of hurry or things to do uh, at all. And uh, uh, maybe it was my projection. I don't know, but uh, the sense. Oh my God! This is what this is how we are meant to live and not rushing because we have a list of to-do things yeah yeah it's a, that this notion that there's actually something calming that there's peace of mind in the understanding that we sort of are time that we that we don't that we're not hounded by this objective external thing it yeah puts, i'm entirely with you in this yes right. puts me obviously in mind of that wonderful uh, quote from uh, uh jorge luis borges which due to the magic of online uh, events i'm able to pretend that i've memorized <laughs> which is, um here it is time is the substance i am made of time is a river which sweeps me along but i am the river it is a tiger which destroys me but i am the tiger it is a fire which consumes me but i am the fire and of course one one consequence of that is that it's very scary to be on a raft being borne down a, uh, uh, a river, but it's not scary to imagine yourself as the river. It's very scary to imagine being burned by fire, but it's not scary to imagine being the fire. And this actually brings me to something I really wanted to ask you before a couple of questions I really want to get in before our 
time is up and we go on to questions in a couple of minutes. Um, you uh, astonished me slightly in the in the order of time book by concluding that you that um, uh, that you do not fear uh, death essentially at all. You write, if an angel were to come for me right now, saying, "Carlo, it's time," I would not ask to be left even long enough to finish this sentence. I would just smile up at him and follow. And I have a confession to make, which is that although exploring time in the way that I've done in my work. Uh, and my life has made me calmer and I think wiser and m more pleasant to be around and less governed by fear and anxiety. It's definitely a work in progress. I'm kind of envious of the notion that your understanding of uh, the physics of time might truly have uprooted this kind of fear. And as you point out, it's not because things are not going to change. It's not because you're not going to die. It's not because you've started to believe in eternity instead, right? Um, so I've got to ask you in, about this quote and also more generally about the day-to-day -day emotional psychological consequences of your work in this in this field, because it seems like you're a, it seems like I would like that experience. <laughs> well, let's, uh, <clears throat> let me say, I, I was very sincere in writing those, uh, uh, those paragraphs, and I do feel like, we, like, like that. I've no idea what's going to happen to me. Maybe, you know, I get COVID tomorrow morning, I panic, and I say, no, I don't want to die. <laughs> it's, it's possible. So I don't want to claim any, 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 any particular wisdom in that regard. So, but I have never been scared of death. I'm scared of uh, pain, pain. I'm scared of suffering, of being in a bed of a hospital, powerless in the hands of, I mean, I'm scared of a lot of things. I'm scared that people would not love me anymore. I'm scared, of, I'm not that, it's not that I have a, I'm not a Buddha uh, <laughs> beyond the fears. Uh, but that's itself, no. I mean, in fact, um, I have also an age in which I look at my life. It's, uh, I'm very happy with my life. It's, it's very nice. I mean, other people had things that I did have not got but that's normal everybody gets things that others didn't get and uh, um and uh i, I don't think that uh, uh i have a set there's a million things I, in, in my to-do list there are many things i would like to finish but i know as you say nicely in your book that that's very good but that's not a problem if you i'm not going to finish all of them that's the point i mean it's good to have them it's good to be there and do try to do what they um what they are i have no idea whether uh this comes from my character from my studying time or life because time has been a main subject of all my work in uh, in physics, or simply by you know by getting old, <laughs> or just by reading a lot of books and talking to a lot of people, I don't know. But my attitude has changed uh, uh, in in the ages in the sense that I was much more burning when I was in my twenty. Uh, that's probably good. It's a way to be. I mean, you you are thirsty of life horrendously when you're you're, you're thirty. And then you, uh, the Bible has this um, fantastic uh, expression. I don't know how it says in uh, uh, in English. In Italian, is um, um, uh, uh, satisfio di giorni, satisfied with the days, or something like that. Full of days. Is it, um, yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, yeah. I'm I'm one step away from knowing that famous that famous line in English. Um, yeah. So I, th I think I think that uh, it's uh, we should. Uh, I think as a society also, we should not be afraid of talk of talking of mortality, and we should not give for granted that we have to fear mortality. Because if we give for granted that we have to fear mortality, we we convince one another that we should fear it. There's no mm -hmm. point in that. Well, we spent the whole of the time set aside for our conversation talking about time. And so it's, I don't, I'm going to try and sneak in some question about your wonderful, most recent book, Helgoland, where you, um, one way of thinking about it maybe is that you broaden this, this, the sense that time is, uh, relational to the story of how everything is, is relations and, and relational. Um, yeah. 
But I'm going to sneak that in as a question, probably in the middle of some other people's questions. And first of all, I'm going to turn to uh, some of the questions that we've got here. Um, so let me just kick off with this one, which is very clearly uh, one for you to answer. Matthew Thompson, if consciousness is a property of matter, is that why we are meaning machines? Uh, as Carlos says, as well as why we are time. Do you think that our habit of situating or attempting to situate ourselves outside of temporality is essential to preserve our illusions of control? <laughs> no, that's a great question. Uh, two questions. Um, the second oh. one, uh, no, it's the other way around, I think. I think it's just a mistake. We um, Look, we're not, we don't have an illusion of control. We are in control because uh, um, factually, there are things happening in my brain which I don't control, of course, but it's me. It's happening in this brain. And uh, what's going to happen uh, in the next 20 minutes depend on what happened in my brain. There's no doubt. If my brain, something else has happened, um, the next 20 minutes, something else. So we're, we're in control. And I don't think um, we need to call it an illusion. <laughs> illusion is a funny word. I've written a, a short paper <clears throat> which is called <clears throat> The Mistake of the Old uh, Fisherman. It's a fisherman that uh, see, love the, the, the sunset, okay? And the sunset is, is a, the, the sun that goes down in the ocean and he's really moved by that every evening and so on and so on. And then one day he learns uh, uh, that the sun doesn't move. And so I say, oh my God, this uh, sunset is an illusion. And he becomes crazy because he, he says, no, no, I shouldn't look at that. It's an illusion. I shouldn't go to bed because it's not true that the sun is uh, setting. And it becomes crazy. And what is the mistake here? The mistake here is to think that if we better understand something, the previous understanding we had, uh, you know, the sun that falls in the water of the ocean, it's wrong. And therefore, this uh, something becomes illusory. It doesn't become illusory. It's just better understood. So it's the same for our meaning. And it's the same for our being in control. Uh, if we think that we're outside nature and controlling it from the outside, we're just mistaken as the fishermen who think that the sun goes down in the water. Uh, but still, there is a sunset, still there is meaning, still there is uh, us in control. It just means something different uh, than what we thought in a sort of pre-scientific uh, manner. Science doesn't take away uh, what has been called the enchantment of the world. If anything, it makes it more uh, enchanted because we see the layers and the layers of reality. That's fascinating. Um, there's a question here that I think is interesting, or maybe I'll sort of co-opt it for my own ends, but this is, um, a Buddhist meditate to live in the moment. Why is that a good idea? And, and this sort of, I, I'm gonna piggyback on this question because I know that um, some spiritual approaches to, to the nature of time are, have been important in your own uh work not so much buddhist as hindu philosophy i think uh, as i as i recall but um there's something in a variety of eastern wisdom traditions and i noticed that there's also a question somewhere here but i'm missing it right now sorry about uh uh Taoism, uh, right i guess which sometimes dramatizes these questions um most uh most vividly the first thing I thought reading your book was that, well, if there is no one now, then all this stuff about being in the now is, is even more deluded than, uh, than, um, than everything else. But I, but I was pretty much quickly disabused of that notion. So I just don't know, I guess you could answer the question directly. What's the benefit of meditating to be more in the moment? And then you could maybe just speak a bit about the role that spiritual and religious traditions have fed into your work here. And then I'll answer a question that I think was more. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. To the to the straight question about the benefit of meditation, uh, I don't know because I do not meditate. So um, uh, unless you count walking in the in the forest as a meditation, uh, which you might if you want, um, but I don't do any uh, sort of formal uh, meditation practice. Um, I I have uh, I think that uh, people who don't do it have uh, uh, very interesting experiences, uh, which I, you know, 
Um, I could put in my to-do list and add to the many things I would like to do <laughs> if I had infinite time and if time was a resource. Um, I have uh, uh, found a lot of uh, great ideas uh, and spent a lot of time reading uh, uh, sources that come from uh, Eastern philosophy, um, Hindu, but Buddhist also. I mean, in fact, uh, there is a major Buddhist philosopher, which is Nagarjuna, uh, which uh, um, fills a chapter of my book on quantum mechanics. Uh, I don't think that East and West have been always so separated. There have been a lot of reciprocal influences. It's no surprise that there is, uh, uh, there is today. Uh, for doing science, which is my main job, uh, uh, I always thought that philosophy is important because it gives it gives tools for thinking, for rearranging reality, especially if you work on the nature of space and time for quantum gravity, which is my, um, my job. And uh, in uh, Eastern philosophy, there is, a, there is a wealth of great ideas, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, particularly interesting for a Westerner because we know them less. So when you get to understand, say, oh, great, this is a great idea. Now, spiritual traditions in particular, um, I, uh, I take very seriously uh, what people do in spiritual tra tradition. I, I wish there was more uh, dialogue uh, uh, for science trying to understand in scientific terms what is going on and translate languages. Uh, mm -hmm. The complexity of our brain is astonishing, of course, with respect to our capacity of understanding. <clears throat> we have very little understanding. Um, and I don't see, while I see many religions uh, which sort of hold to beliefs which don't stand uh, with my scientific view of the world, uh, uh, I also find a uh, uh, spiritual tradition, for example, in some part of Buddhism, which I don't see anything in contradiction with my uh, yeah. scientific uh, uh, approach with the world. So I find them an interesting way of introspectively look what happened in the complication of our brain. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. So I'm going to take two questions here that I arrogantly claim are in my ballpark to answer. One of them is, can you explain a bit more about the difference between the task oriented approach to life rather than the time oriented approach? And the other is um, about uh, the concept of our sleep cycles being interrupted by uh, in, the, in the modern world, uh, as opposed to um, times, medieval times and others when there was a tradition in some parts of the world, at least for a for a first sleep and a second sleep and for people to get up and visit neighbors and do other things during the during a, a, a gap in, in the middle. And I think these two questions- Yeah, but I think, no, I think you should, Oliver, you should answer, especially the first one, you should say- Yeah, I was, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I was just gonna say, I think these these speak to this question of, of the rhythms of time and where they come from in our day-to-day -day existence. What, what task orientation standardly means anyway is, is um, is just that the rhythms of time as it's experienced are given by the tasks that um, mm. that fill the day as opposed to uh, an attempt to sort of impose time onto a set of scheduled tasks so it's very obvious in the in the context of small scale agriculture which is why it ends up you end up talking a lot about one ends up talking about pre-modern times but also some indigenous societies uh, at various other times in, in history and today, that if you are that closely yoked to the rhythms of nature for what you do, um, it, it, it's not intuitive to think about all of that as unfolding alongside some kind of objective yardstick, right? I mean, if you have a few cows and you need to milk them whenever they need milking, or you grow some crops and you need to harvest them when they need harvesting, um, it doesn't it, it doesn't get off the ground as a concept to um, to try to sort of um, organize the day in the way that people like me who sit around with laptops feeling bad about how many emails we've got are, are trying constantly to um, to to do to organize the day. And I think the you know the the question of sleep cycles and circadian rhythms is clearly it's biology. It's not that's outside my terrain, but like the the notion that the that uh, the electric light and other developments permitted us to impose rhythms on to time that came from our 
egoic rational you know from our frontal cortex is rather than from our bodies and maybe to our detriment i think is all is all a big part of that it's fascinating looking back at some of this stuff um the work of the historian ep thompson especially when that you see people struggling to try to convey how long something takes when they don't habitually think in terms of quantified <laughs> time and they talk about these these phrases that you get uh, that i write about in the book like um uh, a miserary while the number the amount of time that it's <laughs> miserary or a pissing while um these phrases that that occur in medieval um records that are just the best effort to sort of compare one thing to another because you don't just say well it's about two minutes or about 10 seconds or whatever it is. And so um, I think that's the, the crucial difference. I think we should say that, you know, there is an awful lot of things that we couldn't have today if we, uh, that we, that we benefit immeasurably from in our lives that we couldn't have if we, if we didn't have uh, this kind of uh, uh, abstract uh, notion of time. But in that abstraction, there is an alienation. There is something that, um, that goes wrong. Uh, yeah, no doubt. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, nowadays in this year's technology, which has been developed, just uh, that serves to, to save us a few minutes, right? You don't want to, I don't know, to call a taxi, wait for a taxi, and you you just type a certain thing on the smartphone, uh, or, or or anything else. So we are saving minutes, saving minutes, saving minutes, and the more we save minutes, uh, as you constantly point out to your book, the more we feel we have not enough time as a result, which is astonishing result. It's a, it's a funny thing, right? We, there was a moment in which not long ago, um, in the 19th century, which the, the idea was, okay, now we have technology, we can all work less, and we have a, a large amount of leisure time. Uh, it was an ideal for development of, uh, of, the, of the world. It didn't go that way at all, zero. It's really uh, crazy to ask a to do a question like this with uh, two minutes left on the clock, but I can't resist. Uh, this is a question from Natalie, who connects the the mystery here of time with maybe the other obvious, um, utterly baffling mystery of being human, which is consciousness, and says, "Can you talk about consciousness? Is time actually consciousness?" Um, uh, this is this question uh, of how. Uh, the feeling of being inside our heads or whatever, however you want to describe it, that the way that that seems to emerge from the, the matter of our brains is obviously a, a, a huge and compelling mystery. And uh, to begin talking about it at 7.29 and an event that finishes at 7.30 is uh, extre extremely unrealistic, but say something. I mean, is there a, it, it, consciousness seems temporal our time would have no meaning for us, just as nothing would have any meaning for us without consciousness. They are both profound mysteries. Does, is that a clue that they are somehow the same thing or close to yes, I, yes, I think so. So in, in, in 30 seconds, <laughs> what I would like to say is I think it's a, it's a mystery for us, but I don't think it's a mystery that we cannot dispel. I mean, it's like... A, life uh, 50 years ago it seemed enormously mysterious life and then you know we sort of have got what it is some biochemistry with some thermodynamics with some i mean a lot of open things but we we understand what's life okay and uh, if uh, we're not in the same position with respect to consciousness we are much more confused uh, but i think enough neuroscience enough serious philosophical engagement uh, in our physics because uh, uh, physics i talk about that in the last part of helgoland uh, um takes away some of the in my opinion takes away some of the apparent reasons for uh, for 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 which the problem seems so hard consciousness uh, because uh, the the physical world is more close uh, to our experiential world than uh, uh, the, in, in modern physics that in the last century uh, and uh, are we going to understand? I hope so, and I think so, and I seems obvious to me that a big part of understanding that is precisely the connection of the feeling of passing time. We are certainly, we're not going to understand consciousness as, as something static. It's a process, and so it's a process, uh, and the way we think time is deeply connected to this process itself. So yes, I think our experiential time 
and the uh, conscious are going to be understood together. Um, this has been a totally fascinating conversation for me. Oh, your your image froze for me for a while there, but you're back, I think. Uh, maybe it was, maybe oh. to everyone else it was my oh. image. Who knows? Maybe the internet out there. And, Maybe it's a time oh, glitch in the US. Yes, right. Um, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for this conversation. I hope it's been uh, illuminating to people listening. Thanks, especially for everyone for the great questions. I think I'm handing back over to Jack now. Is that correct? Let's see. Yes. Thank, thank you, Oliver. Thank you. I've been extremely generous, and uh, this was extremely nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlo and Oliver, for that conversation. It was, I truly feel, as I'm sure everyone in the audience does, I feel like I had my mind opened and you've given us so much to reflect on and think about. Um, don't forget, everyone, that you can buy Carlo and Oliver's books uh, from our bookshop partner, New and Books. The details there are in the chat. Um, and thank you all for tuning in and for your brilliant questions. Coming up at 5 by 15, we have a very special event with Phoenix Department Store on the 10th of October about the future of fashion. We've got some fantastic speakers lined up who are right at the forefront of change in the industry. And these include Ajib Barber, Kenya Hunt and Phoebe English. The conversation will be hosted by the brilliant journalist and writer Lucy Siegel. We hope to see you there. The tickets are available on our website. And thank you again, everyone, for tuning in tonight.